Good. Youth Lady, you have the floor. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi Kurt. It's a pleasure to be joining you all again uh, this evening for our our final shiur before we uh, before we end this series. Hopefully, the first of many as we enter into the Yamim Noraim. Uh, tonight, Acharon Acharon Chaviv, we come to Rabbi Moshe Kurtz. Uh, Rabbi Kurtz serves as the assistant rabbi of Congregation Aguda Shalom in Stamford, Connecticut, and also serves as a member of the Vada Kashras of Fairfield County. Rabbi Kurtz holds a BA in psychology from Yeshiva College um, and an MS uh, from the Azraeli Graduate School of Jewish Education and Administration. Um, while at REITS, he served under the tutelage of Rabbi Dr. Moshe Tenler. Um, he also served as the rabbinic intern at the Young Israel of Plainview, um, from where his wife is from, as is mine, so we know each other very well. Um, and Rabbi Kurtz uh, has also published a number of articles, um, hopefully many more to come, on fascinating topics. And I now turn it over to Rabbi Moshe Kurtz, a great rabbi and good friend. Thank you very much, Rabbi Buchler. And one thing that Rabbi Buchler didn't mention, actually, if anyone wants to cheat, this very topic that we're about to do right now actually uh, was just published this morning in the Lair House. So if anybody wants to cheat and uh, reveal everything that I'm about to share and then log off and you don't have to hear me rant, then uh, feel free to do so. But uh, if you don't want to cheat, you're welcome to look at it after this year. Or now that I told you about it, I'm sure you'll all Google it. That's fine by me. You can listen to share or read it. It's uh, mostly the same material, though you'll get probably some of my snarky comments if you stay on. Anyway, speaking of which, our topic for tonight, we are going to talk about adding, changing things that are in our liturgy. This is going to be, oh, if we could just uh, get mutes going, okay. This is going to be particularly relevant as we enter into the Yom Narayim, into the High Holidays. Now, why is that? Well, we got Slichos, we have Piyutim. That was another shear we did a while back at Aguda Shalom. We talked about um, if Piyutim are permissible to begin with, and if so, can we limit the amount of Piyutim that we do? Not just during COVID, but during a normal year. However, I, I'm going to not talk about that so much because I don't want to throw my colleagues under the bus right now. Um, whatever the, your rabbis say, go for that. Don't listen to what I have to say. And a good, good call in general, right? So if I were to ask you, what would be the potential issues if I, let's say I'm singing, you know, sim shalom tova. And, you know, you get to a certain point where the tune doesn't really fit with the words. And you have to add some nine and nines. You repeat some of the words in there. Is that something that's okay to do? What about um, during slichos? You're singing, well, Machnise Rachemim is its own can of worms. But basically, anyone who I hope is all of us at some point attended a service at Shul, and we likely at some point heard a chazin that added some nine and nine, some repetition. I should be careful what I say because I see uh, our chazin Sandy just logged on. So I have to be careful what I share over here. But uh, I know you're not leading this year, so uh, I could be a little cavalier. Okay. Now, if I were to ask you, you could put this in the chat, by the way, just to keep things cleaner. What are the potential issues with repeating words? Well, this is our goal. We're going to identify what are the potential issues and then potential tentative solutions to at least some of the issues. But while you're thinking about that, you could type it in the chat as we go. I want you to take a look at the PDF. So you know what? Some of you just logged on right now. So I'm going to share it because I don't think you can see it in the chat yet. I'm going to share it one more time. And uh, whoever comes later, they'll just have to email me for a copy of it so we could keep the flow. So there you go. PDF, the source sheet is there. My style is that I hope that you can click on that PDF and follow along as you as you like. But I have my own hard copy right over here that I'll be referencing. And at times, if there's a particular line that I really want you to see, I'll use screen share. So that document will be very helpful for you. So you ever watch like a movie, particularly an action movie, where there's what they call a cold open action scene? It starts off with a high-speed chase. There's guns blazing and crazy things are happening. Bombs are exploding. And then all of a sudden, 24 hours earlier, then everything's calm and fine. And it shows you how they got to that point. That's what we're going to do right now. Look at source number one at the Arach HaShulchan. The Arach HaShulchan starts off by saying, 
Shababono Seinu Harabim Zaz Siru Shom Shapasa Hamisa Pachas Eitzla Hachazonim. In the multitude of our sins this past decade, a leprosy has spread among our cantors, among our chazanim. Now, uh, I, I know uh, the Stanford people, you have a little bit of an advantage here because it's uh, in our Monday night shuva class, I pointed this out multiple times. Who can remember? When you see the words, Ba'avono Seino Harabim, in the multitude of our sins, in, ha- in uh, shuva or in halachic literature, what does that indicate to us? Anyone remember? You can type it out if you want. You know what? I'll keep it simple. That way we don't have to start muting and unmuting. What I always tell everyone is, it means that you're in for a treat. It means it's going to be something fun. In the multitude of our sins, what is this great leprosy that is spread among the Chazanim? says, what he tells is, and I never heard of it until I read this. I actually had to look up the translation for it. There's something called, and some of you are going to laugh at me because maybe you guys all know what this is. It's called a tuning fork, which certain professional cantors would use. And apparently, I'm not exactly sure how it operates, but they would use it to determine the frequency of or the, the uh, key that they're using so that they can reach the perfect pitch. That's my understanding of it. OK, um, uh, I'm an I'm arts when it comes to these things, but that's my basic understanding. Darach Shulchan says that this is a form of instrumentation. Us. Harvey says, I've seen cantors use them at our shul, maybe. OK, we'll talk about that another time. But Darach Shulchan says this is like using instruments. This is an instrument. As we know, instruments are usur, midrabanan, rabbinically prohibited on Shabbos. Now, a separate shear, which we did last year before Simchas Torah, we talked about how that also, what's included in that, that we ignore sometimes, is dancing on Shabbos and Yom Tov also is usur. How do we circumvent that? So many people dance on Shabbos and Yom Tov. There's a few answers. Uh, one is either we're wrong. The Ramah does have that idea from Tosos. Uh, but others find ways to uh, to permit this. Another shear for another time. But then after he goes on this whole, you forgive the language, a tirade against people who do this. Oh, yeah, he adds one line right at the end before he transitions. If you look at the last line in, in the first paragraph of source one, below Levan, and we see this sometimes. You ever see, you know, there's like something in the shul that maybe is controversial. I remember uh, we have Yom Atzimut, Israeli Independence Day services at our shul. So what happens is it just comes up on a weekday and some poor fellow from uh, from Brooklyn or Farakway or Lakewood is passing through. He just wants to cop a Ryan a minion. And then all of a sudden we right after Shimon Esrei, we start hollow. And he's like, dear God, what's going on? Is there a Yontif that I forgot about? And so, you know, some people, they do realize what's going on. And in principle, they walk out for when we say hollow. And you can imagine some people get really upset. Oh, are we too Zionist for you? So this kind of phenomenon predates the founding of the state of Israel. This has happened in the times of Aruch HaShulchan, where he says, Not only do we not have the power to protest this terrible practice of the tuning forks, but if I want to leave shul when this instrument is being used, right? So when they start playing the organ, I want to leave shul because I don't think it's appropriate. Then someone says, oh, I see you're one of those frummies. Oh, you're one of those from people who think that we can't use a tuning fork. So then what happens is it creates a machlokus. People starting to upset each other. Stenders are flying. And it's not just simply that they won't listen to our musr, he says, but also it brews up machlokus. There, it creates a tumult in the shul. But then he transitions to the latter part, the last paragraph. That which people repeat two times, three times the words in our prayers. And then I had to look this one up. What are nutin? And then I was like, oh, I look in translation. Notes. It's a transliteration of notes. It would have taken me a thousand and a half years to figure that one out. Lefnei Amud, why they do this? Lefnei Yizamra Pichuke Hazimra, in order so that they could make it fit nicely with the words. Anyone who sees this, he says, anyone who's ever experienced this, he says, Bechol Yari Lekim Mitzdarim Bazeh. Any conscientious, any God fearing person, they are in agony. They are in pain when they hear this. However, 
What can we do? Nobody will listen to us when we tell them what the Torah has to say. For they do not listen to the Chachamim, which I think the Rosh Hashulchan is also referring to himself, uh, because the Rosh Hashulchan, I believe, was a congregational rabbi. In addition to being a posik for uh, for world Jewry, he was a congregational rabbi. So it's always interesting when you read these lines, you could tell that he's not just talking about in general, people don't listen, but he might also be talking about his own community. So you got to think about the interesting dynamic of this, him writing this. I don't know if he wrote this while he was still a practicing pulpit rabbi. The historians among us who read the Aruch HaShulchan history book that I uh, haven't had a chance to read yet, maybe you could tell me whether that's true or not. Oh, but then what's, so the question is what? People don't listen to the rabbis? Have we ever heard of such a thing? Uh, yes, we, we have heard of such a thing. That happens quite often, unfortunately. But he says, what's the rationale for why they aren't listening to halacha? What's their taina? What well, they say? Because listening to the IEIs and the repetition of the words and the music, this is my own Shabbos. This is how I enjoy Shabbos. This is my own Yantif. This is how I enjoy Yom Tov, how I enjoy holidays. And so what he says is, you know, you know what this reminds me of? When I was learning in Eretz Yisrael, I went away for a Shabbos. I think, um, again, we're somewhere in the north. I had family there. They had friends that were over for Shabbos, over for the meal. So one of the guests, she saw a fly in the house and the fly apparently was buzzing near her ear. She uh, was getting really annoyed. So she was tracking it down, hunting it, and she was trying to kill that fly. She had a vendetta against it. And I said, you know, look, maybe you don't want to do that. Killing a fly in Shabbos is us to do it. You might not want to do that. She said, no, for me, this is my own Shabbos. I have to get rid of that fly. Otherwise, I can't enjoy Shabbos. And on that basis, she was she rationalized, she was Myra Hector to go ahead and to kill the fly. Now we had a separate cheer at Shul last year, Sukkis time, how apropos, about when I'm allowed to trap bugs, when I'm allowed to kill bugs. This didn't meet the threshold for killing a bug, didn't meet the criteria. But sometimes we use these broad principles and we think we're doing the right thing. Ah, oh, oneg Shabbos, oneg Yantif. Therefore, I'm allowed to do whatever I want. You know, it's like covet habrios or tikkun olam. You know, you could. Basically, get any kind of concept. We have to understand Kavod Habrios, for instance, uh, the idea of us having sensitivity to people's uh, dignity that supersedes Dirabanan mitzvos, rabbinical mitzvos, doesn't supersede Midoraisa, biblical mitzvos. So you can't just, you have to know the parameters of a concept before you apply it. Owning Shabbos is not a get out of jail free ticket to do all the malachi you want on Shabbos. That's not how it works. But anyway, that's how people justified. That's how people justified the repetition of words during davening. And when you take a step back from this Aruch Shulchan, you think to yourself, "Wow, that was some heavy stuff. That was some intense musr I just got there." Which, if you'll forgive me, just one more comment, one more editorial. Uh, I, one of the things I love is how, in the modern Orthodox intellectual world, we all love studying Aruch Shulchan as opposed to Mishnah Brura. Uh, I guess maybe because, you know, Aruch HaShulchan is the underdog, and we like to show that uh, Halakha is not uh, monolithic, so we picked Aruch HaShulchan over the Mishnah Brura. So I always found it funny that that's what all the all of us modern Orthodox people like to learn, because the Aruch HaShulchan has many instances of just throwing out Musr in the middle of his Halakhic discourse like that. And from what I know, modern Orthodox people don't like hearing Musr also. So it's uh, it's kind of funny, a little bit of an inconsistency there. I'll leave that for you to think about. But anyway, I've bought us enough time. What could be so terrible that the Aruch HaShulchan had to, had to formulate such a startling, fierce formulation against people who are doing this? Ah, so I'm going to take a look at the chat for a moment. Let's see. We do not have any suggestions I could see yet for what the possible Isser might be. You know, because look, I cannot like the fact that people repeat words. But that's not a good enough of a reason to tell people not to do it unless because, I mean, you know, what's my preference versus your preference? Unless there's an overriding halakhic issue where Hashem has something to say about it. So, OK. Ah, Harvey Berman. Tircha de Tzibura. Tircha, I see. I assume Tircha de Tzibura. An excellent suggestion. And you can see people who know me know why I'm biased to do this topic because of Tircha de Tzibura. So if you'll take a look, actually, we're going to we'll go a little bit out of order because uh, why not? You already mentioned it. All the 
You don't find Tirch and Sibura issues for this in the Gemara, in the Rishonim, and even in the Achronim. It's very hard to track down. At, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not the biggest Tom, I'm not Tom Kacham, you know. So I'm a guy who knows how to look in the back of a Masifta and look up references and put things together. So it's possible I missed something. But Rav Natali Hafner in his DNA Tfilas Shachar, source number ten, in source number ten, he actually introduces the concern of Tircha Ditsibura. That if you're putting a lot of nine and eyes and you're putting and you're repeating things over and over and over again, you know, it's like it's like we have this debate uh, in shul when you finish in you go like nine, 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 nine. And they're like half, half the people are like, OK, pizza, my guitarist, so let's go. And other people are like, no, I'm getting into the singing. And, uh, you know, you see it also if you did Nefesh. Right before we have the shir and shul and shavuot and because we don't have food in the shul yet again. So some people like to do the, another round of nine and eyes. So tirkat tzibura imposing on the congregation's time is certainly something for us to consider. I was leaving more toward the end, but because you brought it up, Harvey, we'll bring it right to the beginning. But okay, I've witnessed a fight break out in the shul of tirkat tzibura. Ah, ironically, fighting over some tirkat tzibura in middle shul might lead to a bigger tirkat. So uh, it's a, it's a good point. But anyway, let's let's go let's go in order. Let's start from the very beginning. Beginning is a good place to start, as I'm told. Sound of music. The Gemara in Mesechus Brachos, source number two, says anyone who says Modi Modin, the shots is up there, the chazin, and he's uh, going ahead. He says Modi Modin, thank you, thank you, Meshakin or so. We silence him on the spot. Why the Gemara says the Mitzikishteirushuyos. It looks like he's acknowledging two different deities. Back in the day, they were concerned about Zoroastrianism, which believed in a theological cosmic dualism. They believed this. I'm not an expert in Zoroastrianism, but my my uh, basic understanding is that there was a God of good and light. There was a God of evil and darkness. Christianity kind of adopted that, I believe, along you know with the idea of the devil, the idea of Satan. And so the issue is that when I say modim, modim, it sounds to, like to everyone that I'm acknowledging two gods. And certainly, we don't want to imply anything heretical in our prayers. The thing with that is, how many times are you going to repeat something in davening that's going to have some sort of heretical implication? You might at sometimes have that, but I don't know if that's enough of a basis to prohibit across the board all repetitions. Maybe certain repetitions that sound heretical, but that that you know that is much more limited in scope, I would assume. However. The Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud's take on it, is that what's the issue? The issue is that you're Dovre Sheker, source number three. The Talmud Yerushalmi tells us, what's the concern of acknowledging two deities? No, okay, we don't think that you, you're in a base HaKnesset, you're in a shul. You didn't come here to pray to another religion. You're here to pray to Hashem. But the words you're saying have false implications. We're worried about you speaking words of falsehood. And by acknowledging two deities, we don't think you're a heretic, but speaking words, changing and altering the, the words of Daving to the extent that it gives a false implication or connotation, that's problematic. You're changing the meaning of the Davening itself. However, so these two concerns are mentioned in the Gemara. But again, how many times Ramosha fights against a Jew where he outlines, I think, in Yitzvah of Malchuscha, there's certain ways you can repeat the words that gives a false implication. I see Nat Samer put in the repeating at the end of Aleinu, Ushemo. Oh, maybe that is as well. I didn't think about that. Ushemo, Ushemo, Ushemo. And also repeating Psukim might, might be a problem. But then the Gemara set tells us follows follows, source number four. You see, if all I had was that line in the Bavli, that line in your Shami, okay, great. As long as I don't alter davening, that it gives off any heretical connotations. I'm not. No one's going to think I'm a Zoroastrian. No, uh, I'm not going to say it in a way that sounds false, like I'm lying, like I'm changing the meaning. So then, okay, isn't they? It's a it's a free for all now. Open season on davening. Not so fast. The Gemara tells us uh, because of limited time, we're not going to go through this shock of attire through the back and forth in the Gemara. But what the Gemara in source number four in the continuation of the Gemara in Brachlis tells us is that there is something called being Meguna. When you say Shema Shema, you repeat Shema twice, it may not always have heretical implications, but altering davening and repeating the words 
is something that is meguna, something that is disgusting or reprehensible, something definitely that we don't want you to do. Now, what's the difference between the two? The first two categories, if someone says something heretical or false, we silence them on the spot. You know, the rabbi or the gabbai, we like clop on the bima, they stop the shots in his tracks. Over here, some in Maguna, you shouldn't be doing it. Shul policy should not allow for it. But, you know, you don't make a scene in the middle of dominating about it. It doesn't reach that threshold. You wait till afterwards. You go over to the guy and say, look, next time you're up there, just remember uh, not to repeat any words. But still, Maguna. But the question we're left with is, what makes something Maguna? What makes something maybe not the threshold that I need to silence the guy on the spot and make a scene out of it? But what would be other concerns for the repetition of lyrics of words in our davening? So there is a response, a tshuva of the Maharam Shik in source number six. This Maharam Shik, from my understanding, again, I haven't gone through every last tshuva in it, but I'm fairly certain Olach Ronim, who come after the Maharam Shik, cite this tshuva as precedent for all future discussions about word repetition. Why is this Maram Shik in source number six so important? Because he on his own identifies five potential issues with repeating words. One of them we said already, which is speaking falsehood based on your shalmi. But then if you take a look at the tshuva, you'll forgive me, I just simply didn't have the patience to translate all of it, but I'll give you the highlights outside. Issue number one, there are a few technical issues. Technical issue, Baal Tosef. In general, we're not supposed to add on to mitzvos. In fact, adding on to something quanti quantitatively might even detract from the quality of the mitzvah. God says, I want four pairs, four tassels at tzitzis, not five. You add on a fifth tassel, you're over on Baal Tosef. You're not supposed to add on to the mitzvahs God gave us. God had very specific reasons. We cannot change that. Now he says it might only be Baltos and Midrabanan. We'll leave that on the side for now. As Roshachter always likes to say, look, we you know we're rabbinic Jews. We keep Midrabanans also. So it shouldn't make a difference for our purposes. Concern number two was Shekher speaking falsehood. Concern number three, another technical one, but I think very important, is the concern for a hefsik, for an interruption. Certain interruptions during davening are so severe that ironically, they require you to start that section of davening and repeat it all over again because it was not valid the first time around. And Ram Shik says repeating words can run into an issue of a hefsik. Now, Ramosha Feinstein, footnote, this is source, uh, source number eight. Ramosha Feinstein, the shuva, gets tech into the technicalities. And basically, the upshot is he says there's a high threshold for repetition constituting a hefsik. He thinks you would have to either change the meaning, um, you would have to be deliberately doing it in a way that it just becomes utter nonsense. But if you repeat things in a way that doesn't compromise on the meaning of the prayer, it's a hard argument to make that it's a hefsik, an interruption to the degree that it actually renders the entire prayer invalid. Nonetheless, the Maram Sheikh says, this is an issue that we need to reckon with. But then afterwards, we come to, so that's number one. We have the technical issues. Baltos and Hefzik, these are real bona fide halachic issues, and we need to deal with them. We need answers for them if we think that it's permissible to repeat during certain parts of Davin. But then concern number four and five he gives us are of more of a, let's call them a meta halachic or a philosophical nature. These concerns are as follows. Number four, the Gemara, this is a great thing, uh, great thing to share for Shir Shirim. I think we did this uh, past Pesach. We did a Shir about this. We talked about Jewish pop music. What's the issue of Jewish pop music? Well, the issue is there's a Gemara, Mesech Sanhedrin, that the Torah is Chugeret Sak. The Torah wears sackcloth and mournfully comes before God and says, when we use the words of the Bible, we use the words of our Tanakh for the purpose of music, for entertainment. Your children have taken me and they've used me for an instrument that clowns play with. 
In other words, we're taking the words of davening, or rather, we're taking we're taking the words of davening, we're taking the words of prayers, we're taking the words of sukkim, holy words, and we play around with them so that we can fit the tunes that we enjoy to give ourselves a degree of gratification. And so philosophical issue number one is something to think about is when we do certain things during davening, are we doing them for Hashem or are we doing them more for ourselves? It's not an easy question to answer because I would suggest it's not really a binary. Many, you know, a good example of this is where Moshe Feinstein, I heard a story. Again, all, all the Gadom stories I remember are attributed to Moshe Feinstein. I remember one time I was at some Chabad place and I told her a story about, about Moshe Feinstein. And the Chabad Chassid said, wait, that's about the Lubavitcher Rebbe. What are you talking about? So insert your favorite Gadol here, as I always say. So the so what happened was is that someone who was Mechaber Storm, someone who wrote a book recently, as usual, you go to a great post, a great rabbi for an approbation for Askama. And so he goes to Moshe Feinstein and he says, guiltily, you know, I feel bad. You know, when I published this, there was a huge element of gaiva. I wanted the recognition uh, that I'm a Talmud Chacham and I published a safer. And Moshe Feinstein says, you know what? That's a good thing because everybody has a degree of gaiva when they do it. And at least you're self-aware enough to acknowledge that. Meaning, yes, you did it for the right intentions of producing Torah for people to learn, but also at the same time you did it for yourself. And one is not a contradiction to the other. So somebody think about when we're davening, are we doing it, I wouldn't say for one or the other, but is it primarily for God or is it primarily for us? That's, that's one thing to think about. The fifth consideration, which is our second overarching philosophical idea to think about, is how do we talk to God? There's a whole discussion about, do I shuckle and I daven? Would you go to a politician? Would you go to a Malach Basar Vadam, a non-Jewish king, a non-Jewish leader, and you are advocating on the behalf of the Jewish community? And you go over to him, you start chuckling and like, so I have a point that I need to make to you. And then you added some ay 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 and you and then you repeat words, dear Mr. Politician, I Mr. Politician. So it sound it sounds absurd. They would call the psychiatrist, and that'd be the end of your meeting. The issue is when I talk to Hashem, shouldn't the same standards apply? That I should talk to Hashem at least in the public arena. Now we could distinguish, your Shami does distinguish between private prayer versus public prayer, right? Because we know that it's about the lave, it's about the heart when we pray. But at least in the public sphere, there needs to be a certain degree of decorum. So for instance, something that's popular nowadays is um, whether it's during slichos or during uh, different kinds of uh, prayers, people will bring in a guitar, they'll start dancing, and they'll be jumping up and down. And besides the potential isser of dancing, which is an explicit initiative in Beitza, there's also this question of, of the decorum in the base medrash as well, in the shul as well. Something, again, to think about, overarching considerations. Ravavadi Yosef cites this Maram Shik as precedent and he says, yes, you can alter the words of davening because this would violate the age old principle of being that you are altering the text which the sages have coined. Something that especially has an explicit formulation by Chazal, we're not allowed to alter that text. A share we did as a parenthetical, a share we did at the shul was about the bracha shlo sani isha, about saying, thank you, God, for not making me a woman, which men say. We did shuva from Hankin. It's the first uh, shuva in volume four in Chalik Dalit, where he's very sympathetic. He wants to find solutions for those who aren't too happy about it, or at least to help a rabbi who has congress who aren't too happy about it. It's an interesting background to the shuva, I think. And so he says, look, I'm going to try finding solutions. One solution, by the way, was start dominating a rabbi Yishmael. That way, you don't say any of Birchus Shachar. I would maybe agree with that, but for other reasons, because starting Rabbi Shmuel, it does make things a little bit more streamlined. But he says, you can't just change the bracha. Shlomo Sani Isha is explicitly formulated in the Gemara, and it's immutable. We have no right to touch it. We're not permitted halachically to touch it. If you say a different bracha, a different formulation, you have not been yotze. You have not fulfilled your obligation to say that bracha. 
So that's the concern that Ravad Yosef hammers home. And then, of course, he uh, says, source number seven, and what do all the Chazanim do? They do whatever they want, whatever their hearts desire, and they don't listen to what the rabbis have to say. So he's calling this actually from the Shaz Shuz Bakudas Elazar, I believe. And uh, it's a similar theme that you see running through many of the rabbinic sources that they've tried to convince people. Otherwise, people really want to dance. People really want to repeat words. And that those are things that have happened to the chagrin of many rabbinic authorities. Along a similar line of reasoning, uh, if you look in, at the other, the other passage from Ravadio Yosef in source number nine, he quotes Rev Yosef Engel, who says, what's the issue over here? Remember before our dichotomy was, is the davening more about me or is it more about God? Well, to make a bit of a, uh, you forgive, you forgive the, uh, the formulation, a bit of a trinity over here. There is the chazin as well, who is in this, who's in the consideration, who's in the running here. He says, in source number nine, the underline, I need to be thinking about God when I'm praying. Certainly in the first bracha, Shemona Esrei, if I don't have Kavana, I'm not thinking about the first bracha of Shemona Esrei. When I read it, I'm technically supposed to go back and repeat it because I was not yoked to see the bracha. We pass and you don't go back because this says a lot about our current condition. We have such a little Kavana that if we went back to repeat the first bracha, we probably wouldn't have Kavana the second time around either. Anyway, um, he distracts their kavana about thinking about the prayers, about the words, about God. All he does is make them think about the tune and to think about his voice. There's an excellent shuva, the Rashba, that talks about this. How Chazanim had made the davening more about themselves than about the actual davening. They would make things go longer in the hopes of getting accolades. The ironic thing is, you make Dominic go really long. There might be a few accolades, but same way. Look, I give speeches all the time. If I go over time right now, past 915, some people may have really liked this year. But as my father always told me when I started uh, public speaking, he says, you can get the best of our tour ever. But the second you go over time, you lost everything. So with that being said, let us proceed. Then we get to source number 10, which is Harvey's consideration. The consideration of Harvey and Rabbi Naftali Hafner. And also, there, I, I came by when I was looking at this, uh, a fellow named Rabbi Yeshua Grunstein. I think he um, works for Ortora Stone. So he's also uh, apparently has similar proclivities to myself and uh, gave a sheer about this topic. And he has a very passionate argument for the Tirchat Zibur concern, more passion than even I can muster. And uh, I encourage you to listen to it when you have a chance. It's linked in the essay format. So Tirchat Zibur, imposing on the Zibur's time. Again, it's a hard argument. Look, I, I'm the most sympathetic person to see where you're going to find, at least in people in my line of work. Um, but that being said, a few not a nice here, especially if it's the will of the seaboard. If the majority of the congregation wants it, wants you to sing during Angelicane or they want you to sing during Gidusha, it's hard to argue it's Tirkat Sibura if you are doing what the seaboard wants. Uh, now, again, how do you assess the will of the seaboard? That's a very tricky thing to do. You know, the older generation might want a, a five hours with all the piyutim. The younger generation might want almost no piyutim. I remember someone told me last year for high holiday tickets, he said, I would pay twice the amount this coming year for high holiday tickets if you give me the same davening that I got last year. Twice the amount. He said it tongue in cheek, but I'm not sure if he was really lying. I think there are a lot of people who would pay twice the amount if they got the same service. So uh, I did my best when advocating, but you'll see what we come up with at Shul. Uh, so after all is said and done, it looks like the odds are stacked against the people who like to repeat words. What are possible justifications for this? It's a rhetorical question because time is limited, but uh, I'll try to end at 9.15 to take questions. Dara Shulman says, look, if you look in the Gemara, it gives us explicit mentions of modim modim shma shema. Who are we to extrapolate beyond the explicit examples in the Gemara? The question we have to ask ourselves is, the, are the examples in the Gemara a paradigm or an exception? I mean, did the Gemara need to single out modim modim and shema shema because otherwise I'm allowed to repeat? Or is it that here's a paradigm 
of different kinds of things that you shouldn't repeat because they're problematic. And you should extrapolate that in general to other instances that are problematic. So the Aruch HaShulchan, he doesn't really, he gives as a justification this idea. He gives as what we call a limud schus. Very similar to how the Aruch HaShulchan said, you could say Shema, you know, this is a, again, a controversial uh, topic to bring up for another time. But the majority of rabbinic authorities believe that there is a chiyah for a married woman to cover her hair. So the Aruch HaShulchan, he had to address the phenomena that many people, many women, many Orthodox women were not covering their hair. So what he does is he tries to come up with a limit schus for those who say Shema in their presence. That's a limit schus. A limit schus is, I'm not sure if I have an argument that I myself buy, but if all the Jewish people are doing something and God is guiding us with Ashkacha, God is guiding us with providence, there must be some halakhic basis for what they're doing. So that's, um, that's what we call a limud schus, meaning it's a forced argument. And you can judge whether it's compelling or not. I know many of us are biased to accept it, not just as a limud schus. Um, but finally, what this brings us to is source number 13, which is the tie-in for Yom Kippur. Right? Otherwise, it sounds just like an arbitrary shear. But what's the tie-in to the Yom Narayim? So the tie-in is, if you look in Tosvos, in Masechus Brachos, source number 13, Tosvos talks about, what do we do at the end of Nihila? We repeat things a lot of times. So, repeat, so Shema Yisrael, is there an issue repeating Shema Yisrael? Tosvos says, better not to do that. Toshalo Lomar, after going back and forth. But then he says, that should we say Hashem Hu Elokim, Hashem Hu Elokim, seven times. He says, because, and also we do on Shana Rabbah, the reason this is appropriate is because it's Maramis, it alludes to the seven ascensions of heaven, of the firmament, leading up to God. And so we say Hashem Elokim, the Lord is God, seven times. And that he actually says, Minakashur, it's a Minakashur. And it leads us to the Bach. The Bach is perhaps the most important source for permitting the repetition of words that you'll find in source 14, where he's talking about slichos, another very important thing that we do this time of year. Reminder, we got 6 a.m. slichos tomorrow, Shul, for all who'd like to join us. Now, and also 10 o'clock tonight, should you so desire. The Bach says that there's actually a value to the repetition of words. You see, when we repeat words, it's not that we're repeating them mindlessly, but, you know, sometimes a speaker may repeat words not because they're not organized, but they repeat something for emphasis. They repeat something for emphasis, to emphasize a point. So when I repeat a word when singing, when davening, maybe that's a means for me strengthening my kavana emphasizing an important part of tefillah and helping inculcate, imbue it in the hearts and minds of those who gathered to daven at shul that day. He says also the tlas is zimni havi chazaka. After all, we know the age old principle in halacha, when you do something three times, it creates a chazaka. It creates an established practice. If I repeat something three times, it will transcend and it will enter into my heart. It, I will think about it more. I'll create emotional connection with God with the repetition that I do. And in fact, he says, this is something that happens and that what we, when we acknowledge the persecutions that the Jewish people went through, it would sanctify the name of God. And they would, when they were dying, we read these instances of martyrdom, these narratives of martyrdom in the Gemara, where Reikiva and others, they scream in their last dying words, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. That's something you don't want to just say once. That's something that we want to emphasize again and again, so that it enters and remains within the hearts of every single Jew. And repetition, by the way, no one called me out on it. Thank you for being very kind. Source number 15, we actually find in the Mishnah, I'm a Stuk, I know Daf Yomi got it to it relatively recently. Because when I gave this year another context, some of our Daf Yomi people, Chul, David Salah, I was like, oh, we just learned this Gemara. So Baruch Hashem, good timing. In Hallel, we repeat the Pesukim. 
The Mishnah says, Makum Shinagu Lichfol Yichfol, where the Minog is to repeat words, you may repeat. We quasi adopt that. And so for the latter part of Hallel, we're repeating all the lines. The question is, of course, what's the exception? What's the rule? Is this the rule that we're always allowed to repeat in general? Or is this an exception to the rule that for hollow it's permissible, for other instances I cannot? So again, to summarize, we went through a whole number of considerations for why it may be us or might be prohibited to repeat words during davening. Either heresy, speaking falsehood, or perhaps it was baltosev, adding, hefsik, interruption, or perhaps the more metahalachic concerns of misusing davening for my own needs, or how do I speak before God? Or tircha did see bura? All important things to consider. But we said sometimes repetition may actually enhance the davening. And if it could help with the tune, maybe I should do it. But on the other hand, should the tune be serving the music, the lyrics, which are what makes something inherently holy? Tunes don't have any inherent kedusha, even the age-old ones. There's no such thing as tunes having kedusha and halacha as far as I know. Again, I'm not a Tamil Chacham. Someone who's a bigger scholar, they can tell me. But as far as I know, there's no inherent Kedusha. Now, it doesn't mean it's not valuable. It doesn't mean it doesn't help us. But the tunes are in service of making the psukim, making the lyrics that come from scriptures enter our hearts. That's the idea behind the tunes. So the tunes need to be in service of the lyrics, not the lyrics of psukim in service of the tunes. So that's an important guideline as well. But ultimately, halakha so where can we repeat, where can't we repeat? Again, I'm not talking for psak here for different shuls. We have different rabbis, different shuls. You can all decide for yourselves. Each kahila can go in its own direction. You look in the shua, Shevet Chevel Nachlaso, I'm forgetting his name, but he's a, an Israeli academic and also a, you know, a big scholar in traditional literature also, it would seem. This shua of Chevel Nachlaso has everything in it. He basically distinguishes between what it seems to be pre-Talmudic prayers or Talmudic prayers, prayers that were before the canonization of Talmud, like Shlo Sani Isha, that bracha, versus things like Piyutim, thing, it, prayers like Kabbalah, well, Kabbalah is mostly Tehillim, but the parts that aren't Tehillim, like Lechadodi, that were created afterwards. Because there's after the canonization of Talmud, we like to have respect for early Rabbanim, we're, we're, we're you know, small people on the shoulders of giants, but nonetheless, hey mamru hey mamru. The rabbis giveth, the rabbis taketh. The same rabbis were able to institute a different, uh, a new piyot, a new song. We have the same authority as them to alter that. Them should we so desire. You know, you look at prayers for like America, for Israel. Those are things that are subject to change. They are made recently. There's no reason that they cannot be changed. However, our Shmona Esrei, Birchos Kriya Shema. Okay, there, there is, you know, you look at different nusachim, there are certain difference, certain variances, but after that, we're not allowed to touch it. It's immutable. Later prayers, yes, but pre the canonization of the Talmud, anything in there, I believe, is hands off. That's my personal guideline. When I do Kabbalah Shabbos, I'll do nine, 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 because honestly, I mean, we could debate whether there's even a chia for an individual to do Kabbalah Shabbos. That's for another shear. But for prayers which are absolutely obligatory, Prayers that are mandated by Chazal, we don't have the power to undo Chazal the same way we can't do undo the you know Yom Tov Sheni, which everyone whenever I interview for whenever I interview for rabbinic positions are like, so Rabbi, can you get rid of Yom Tov Sheni? Sorry, I don't have the power to do it. Wish I could, I don't have the power. And so that's my ultimate conclusion on the matter. But again, I have my distinguished colleagues, Rabbi Kerbel, Rabbi King, Rabbi Buchler. They'll learn the sugya. They'll decide for themselves what to do for their kahilos. And again, I thank everyone for coming today. It's nine sixteen. I should end right now. And we will proceed to questions uh, until 930 or if we run out of questions beforehand. So feel welcome to either uh, raise your hand or unmute. And uh, let's hear what you guys got. Are you able to unmute? Uh, so, um, Susan, yes. Yeah. So like some people are used to singing things in certain ways in which words are duplicated and sometimes um when they can't then all of a sudden like a large part of the congregational is like in turmoil so you're saying sometimes repetition will, will throw people off no it's the not repetition that will throw ah, people right off. right definitely if it's, and um, it's also something yeah. that they feel 
some people are not that um, 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 competent in Hebrew and the music is one way which they connect mm -hmm. and singing things. Mm -hmm. 100% agreed, Susan. That's definitely the goal here, even according to the Aruch HaShulchan, according to the most, um, I would think, according to the most adamantly against repetition authorities, they weren't advocating notice to get rid of the music. They're just saying we shouldn't, we should pick better tunes that fit the words more appropriately rather uh, than uh, resulting. Yeah. Sometimes the tunes are traditional and they link you. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. Look, there's, um, there are tunes that we grew up with and that touch our souls in ways that other tunes would not. And that's definitely something that needs to be taken into the calculus when, if and when one would decide to change their policy based on the sources that they learn. Again, I always say, I'm only the assistant rabbi here. So I always say, consult your local monorthodox rabbi. We got a senior rabbi who, uh, who uh, knows more than me and uh, we rely on him to make the psak. This is all theoretical. <laughs> okay, very good, Susan. Uh, any other thoughts, questions, or points if you would like to make? I see some things in the chat over here. So maybe I'll take a look at the chat for a moment. Uh, Karbach Minyan. Yes, Harvey. I think uh, Karbach Minyan, uh, you're saying Stirchen Sibura. I remember um, when I was in Shalavim, uh, they did Karbach Shabbos every Shabbos. It's a thing in Israel, apparently. A lot of places do that. So I was very excited when I first came. I got, you know, I was really excited. I loved the tunes. And then eventually it was just too much of anything good. Eventually it gets mononymous and boring. And it happens the same thing every week. And also there's dancing going on, which um, you know, my joke also at, at weddings, I don't like to dance a lot. So I don't dance during the week. Up to him, I come to dance on Shabbos. So it's like Zayr, like Zayr, but we do that all the time anyway. Um, but in Shalvin, what they would do, they, I basically had a Seder. At a certain point, there's a book called Kobe to Sodas Vechakiros. It's a nice little uh, encyclopedia of major Talmudic concepts. And I would actually, I had a Seder. Every couple of Shabbos, I'd go through another entry in there. I had so much time to occupy. And uh, similar to what the Arach HaShulchan described, people got upset at me for doing it. Oh, you think you're too good to be dancing with us? So, but they were too busy dancing, so it didn't create much of a machlokus, thank God. Okay, very good. What else we got? Do we buy my conclusion? How about I ask that? Should I, should I get bold? Do we buy my conclusion? The distinction between earlier versus later prayers, or are some people just saying we should always be able to repeat, or we should never be able to repeat, we should get rid of music altogether. What are our opinions? Rabbi, Rabbi I think the David HaMelech said it best when he said, Ron Anu Sadikim, and everything in his entire songs, um, the word Rina, uh, yeah. everywhere. Absolutely. And, 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 and uh, Zem. So, and you know what, Phyllis, I'll go one step further. We just said in Slichos, Lishmael Rina Vatfila. So the Rina and Tfila have to go together. It, it helps. Now, what do we mean by Rina? What's the Rina versus Shira? But yes, definitely true. And again, I'm not advocating to get rid of music in our tradition. There's nothing more I like than a good, you know, it's Chaim he with the whole with the whole choir. I remember I have a um, I share this with the Stanford folks one time. I had a Persian Chavrusa back in YU. One Shabbos, I eventually got him to go to an Ashkenazi mini with me. Afterwards, I was talking to him and I noticed he looked a little bit um, a little bit disturbed. And I said, oh, well, what's wrong? Is something wrong? You know, I, I, I was the more opinionated guy in the in the couple. That's I guess that's how we went very well together. He wasn't as opinionated, but eventually I, uh, you know, I squeezed uh, his opinion out of him. He said, look, you know, it, it felt like a church service. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, that's so funny because Ashkenazim, when they go to the Sephardic service, they think it sounds like a mosque. So there's there's different cultural assumptions of what you're supposed to hear when you go to a base Hakanesis, when you go to a shul to pray. And um, yeah, look, if, if I went to a shul and I didn't hear them sing Eitz Chaim before putting the Torah away, you know, that'd be sacrilege. God forbid. Wait a second. You, uh, so like suddenly that's in the middle of um, as, we, as we're wrapping up the Torah. I mean, it's not part while we're putting it back. We sing it while it's they're high. wrapping up the Torah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, how, it's how we sing, we sing the Torah to sleep. Verse. We were singing one verse and now they're singing more. I don't know the rest of the words, but. Yeah. What's, what's, so what, is that an issue or are you just making an observation? Well, I don't know where it came from. 
There are some tilos t- that are added that are put in the Sidur that weren't in the original Sidur. That's right. Right, like, right. Prayers got added in throughout the years. I mean, again, the most, you know, prayers got added. I mean, you think about Kabbalah Shabbos. Kabbalah Shabbos wouldn't have been in the original ones. You know, what was that? It was 15th, 16th century? Elliot, Rabbi Buk, you're a historian here. What is it? 15th, 16th? 16th century. 16th century. Thank you. Fairly recent. Anyone before that, before they started dancing around Sadduin Kabbalah Shabbos, would have had it in their, in their Sidurim. So absolutely. I think we're less bothered about adding more. We, our bigger issue is subtracting. And again, there's adding a prayer versus adding something within the prayer itself. For instance, if I wear tzitzis and then I put a shirt on top of my tzitzis, which is generally what human, you know, what, what people do. Um, that's not baltosif on the tzitzis. That is, I'm wearing something on top of my tzitzis. But if I added something to the tzitzis itself, that'd be the problem. So adding something to the formulation of an age-old prayer might be a problem. Adding an additional prayer might not be. Adding a Misha Be'ach, for instance. Again, Rav Yaakov Emden has a huge um, uh, scathing polemic against Misha Be'ach's and how it's tirchut tzibura, how it causes people to wait in shul um, until chatzos, and then they're fasting, basically. Uh, it's, very, uh, it's very good. You know, he, he basically assumed people, uh, if we just mute ourselves when we, when, um, he basically assumed that people didn't eat before davening, uh, didn't go to Kiddush Club. Hi, Madriga. Okay. Rabbi, uh, as far as repetition is concerned, repetition in the right place serves to emphasize the words. So um, absolutely, and that's what the box said. Very good. We can do that too. Good. So we got the Shitas, Phyllis, and the Bach, right? So you're Machami to the Bach. Okay. No, my grandfather was a Chazid. Ah, so okay. So you have a lot of Yichas. Baruch Hashem. Now, now, now you forgive me just one moment. I, I, I know a lot of my Stanford folks here. I appreciate all of your, your insights. And I know we're, we're very comfortable on uh, over here, but I just want to make sure, are there any folks from the other shuls who are kind enough to join us tonight that have questions that weren't able to uh, weigh in yet? No need to be bashful. We, we love you all. You're welcome to come to Stanford anytime. Rabbi Kurtz, can I share a consideration? Ah, oh, Rabbi Keen, leading by example. Yeah, I um, perhaps I'm coming at this with a different perspective, both based on uh, my personal background and also based on the background of uh, the shul that I'm in. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's important to that our tefillah to be engaging toward people who might not have grown up going to shul, right? And, you know, I, speaking from personal experience, um, if I'm someone who did, did not grow up in shul, but I see a shul where they're, they're singing and it's very, um, you know, the, the spirituality is worn on, on one sleeve. I, I think that's something that's more able to draw people in to Avodah Hashem, serving God than a service where it, it really only is something that makes sense to insiders. I mean, that's not universal, everyone's different, but I think generally speaking, that, uh, that type of tefillah with its, that's musical and draws people in mm-hmm. is, uh, you know, I, so there's a this sort of, I guess we'll call a kiru dimension to this as well, which I think uh, should be thrown into the mix. Absolutely, and what Rabbi Keen's raising is an important consideration that our shuls generally, you know, ours as well here in Stanford, and I think pretty much uh, all the rabbis here, we have multifaceted shuls, people coming from various backgrounds with different proclivities. So, I mean, our solution, I go to Shalom, is that we have the, the sanctuary minion, which is more of what you're describing. We have the eight o'clock and the seven o'clock, which are uh, more streamlined, more, I guess, uh, they appeal more to what you, I guess, what you term the insiders. Of course, they're, we welcome anyone to attend any minion that they like. Uh, but yeah, I think the big challenge, of course, comes is when you have one minion that has to house everybody, who are you going to accommodate? You know, it's the question I get. I have my early, you know, the Stanford folks know we have the 630 a.m. Shacharis and uh, it's a set crowd over there. And I don't announce I don't say Mourner's Kaddish. I don't announce Mourner's Kaddish because everybody's like, OK, Rabbi Kurtz, that's fine. Just be quiet. Everyone knows what they're doing here. Every now and then someone who has a yard site walks in and they were expect they expect you to announce it. And um, like this isn't the culture of the minion. So you have to determine who the primary stakeholders are. And it's not always easy. Um, this is why nobody likes rabbis, because we never make everybody happy. 
but uh, so is the tragic tale of our profession. A good compromise leaves everyone a little bit annoyed. Yeah, right? well said. Well said, Rabbi Keen. Yeah, I, I mean, the concern I have sometimes is when a shliach tzibar sort of doesn't grasp what the words are, uh, you know, what sort of say what tone you should be setting, whether uh, to be upbeat or whether to be more uh, plaintive. You know, like with these, um, let's say these musical slichos, you know, <laughs> you know, you just worry that it might bleed over where they're starting to get all, uh, you know, strummy guitars and uh, Ashanu Bagano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, you know, where they, you, know, you get like, they, you know, they, <laughs> just uh, for, are you forgetting the meaning of the words? Just you know? uh, just to cover my hide a little bit. Nat, Nat, Nat Samberg is not referring to any specific minyanum. He's just making an abstract observation. Nothing about what we run at our shul. Right, right. Just an abstract yeah, yeah. observation. Okay. Good. You know, you know, a, a totally Great. different county in a different state. Okay. Good. Okay. Very good. Uh, Sandy, our our cantor, Sandy. I know you've been waiting very patiently over there. I saw you uh, raise your hand before. Do you want to? Do you have a point you want to make? Uh, uh, yes, I, I I just wanted to comment on the fact that because we don't didn't have recorders um, two thousand years ago, we don't know what the twenty five hundred. We don't know what the music of the Levium were in the Beit Hamikdash. Yeah. I mean. But, it, 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 imagine, imagine what they, what the Levium were actually playing during the during the services in the Beis Hamikdash. So yeah. music, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just listening to the whole sheer, and, and I certainly appreciate it. It was a wonderful sheer. Music was was part of our service in the Beis Hamikdash, and it so I'm not quite was. sure. I don't understand. I don't understand the sterilization of of the of the service of our of a service today. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't get. I don't get where they they they, they feel that music is a disruptor rather than an mm -hmm. enhancer. So. So Sandy, your your points very well taken. We don't know what the music sounded like back then. But there was uh, music. But there was there was, and uh, I'll I'll reiterate uh, what I said earlier. Lest anyone walk away and think Moshe Kurtz got up here tonight and said we should eliminate all music from davening. That is absolutely positively not the point that I am making. I support music during davening. I think it engages people, including myself, and I think it adds a degree of meaning and emotional connection to the davening and Tashem, which is what we're aiming for. The kind of tunes we use and where we apply them is simply what we are discussing. Uh, for instance, you know, again, I think what Nat was getting to, I'm not going to use specific examples, uh, to use certain tunes that might be more, um, certain tunes might be more, I'm trying to think of the right word, uh, meaningful, it's very generic, but some might be of a more frivolous nature. Again, you know, we talked about, it. I remember one time someone got up to shul in Felichadoti and they applied a, um, a pop tune from, uh, I'm not going to say her name, but the, the individual who sang the national anthem at the inauguration. Um, can't even use that name in the shear, but an appropriate an appropriateness to the you, meaning of the words. Right. So I think I think also, and this goes back maybe Nat or someone else was saying this before. We have to know a competent shliatzi who needs to know the meaning of the words. Uh, I always find it funny, like the Mizmor Ladavid tunes that we use. So we do like Gam Lech It's like a very jumpy uppy tune for something that's very somber. Uh, I think the traditional tune uh, usually works best. To use like a very uppity jumpity tune for something like that. Um, at least, again, I'm just speaking as an individual. That's the thing with music; it's subjective. It's going to speak differently to different people, and that's why it's hard to mandate policies like that. We try to get, uh, you know, Shlian Sieber, like Sandy, who's competent, knows the range of tunes, and knows how to apply them properly. Uh, anyway, we're at 9.30. Um, I think Thank we you so much. Here. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, um, uh, Rabbis Keen, Buechler, and Kerbel, you can share my information with anyone in your shul. I'm happy to do follow-up questions or to share any uh, future material that we alluded to. Thank you very much, everyone, and for joining us on this series. Thank you to my rabbinic colleagues for teaching and for all of you who survived all the way until the final shear who made it to me. I hope it was not a disappointment, and I hope that you'll join us again in the future. Wishing you all a kasiva v'chasima tova and a good kibben shiar. Thank you, Rabbi. Not to belabor the topic. Thank you to all the rabbis.